Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Um, so welcome to what we call geriatrics for non-geriatricians. It's a case conference series. I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, we're moving towards a project echo, but for the last year or so, we've been doing this where we do um, small lectures, discussions, Q&A uh, with the opportunity for CME, which I know is an opinion with you guys, but we do generally have people from outside the university zoom in to this. This is the first time we're doing like a traditional lecture. Um, students in the past have joined via Zoom, uh, but now we've got a different camera, we've got the room set up, um, we can do it this way. So the first one, the way we're doing this now, is going to be um, Dr. Hanasada, who you may or may not have met yet. Um, and he earned his MD from the American University of Beirut in 1970, followed by a rotating internship. He then came to the Oklahoma University Health Sciences Center in 1971, where he finished a three-year residency in internal medicine and a two-year fellowship in infectious diseases. He remained active on the volunteer faculty and is currently an emeritus clinical professor of medicine and geriatric extended care physician at the VA hospital. He has numerous publications and awards and is a diplomat of the American Board of Internal Medicine and Infectious Diseases. And with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Dr. Sonnen. Thank you. Control risk from the seat here. So can I show my face? You, sorry, you do your thing. Hey, okay. okay. It's supposed to have different objectives. My objective is not to understand where we came from, to appreciate how far we have traveled, to gain mission. Of our past blindness, go to Cuban and blindness government, to learn to recognize and seize chance opportunity. Our gaps, not appreciating where we came from or how far we have Being blind to Cuban's introduction of guns, our patients, and their families, missing chance opportunities, obstructs our path too much. Uh, we are homo sapiens, we have been selected to favor dogma over evidence, because that's how the group kept its cohesiveness. The group was the main reason why we survived. <clears throat> so group survival was key in selection, and to have group survival, you must favor dogma over evidence, otherwise the group is superior. So I think it's in us to respect beyond evidence, and as you will see from then, this has been a very important hindrance to scientific uh, knowledge progression. I, I chose these three quotes just to launch in the, the talk. One is from Churchill. The farther backward we can look, the farther forward you are likely to see. This next one is from Alfred North White, a British philosopher. He says, the universe is vast. Nothing is more curious than the self-satisfied government in which mankind, at each period of its history, cherishes the illusion of the finality of the Christian world of life. Skeptics and believers are all alike. At this moment, scientists and skeptics are the leading government. Advanced and detailed admitted of the mental novelty of art is not medical sense. It is a dead philosophical adventure. The universe is vast. The last quote is from Rupert Brooke, one of the young British poets who died in the First World War. He has a sonnet called the South Sea Sonnet. And the last four lines are Learn for me that before, hear, know, and say, and feel, who have laid our groping hands away. But this tumultuous body now denies, and see, no longer blinded by our eyes. This, I'm going to go through 10 people that I think are historically important to know. Should be working. Try it again. Here we go. Okay. Some of these names are familiar, some are not familiar. Uh, but we're going to take them one at a time and in a way show what dogma did to them, what they did to dogma, and how they seized the coincidence and used it rather than be blinded by their eyes to see and pass through. We're going to start with Pakistan. Okay, Pakistan. 
Italian tradition poet, mathematician, geographer, astronomer, appointed professor at the University of Padua at the age of 19. Can you imagine if you're a professor of medicine at 19 years old? He believed in atomism. Atoms and void collide, cluster, form substances. So they're saying atoms combine to form compounds. And he was a student of atomism. Comes from Greek. Tom is count, hence tomography. A uh, is no. Atom is what cannot be cut any further. So the Greeks realized that if you keep cutting something, and then tonight we reach a point where you can't cut it. They call that the atom. The, the theory of atomism is as bold as Epicurus. We're talking about the fifth century BC. Now, Fracastoro proposed that epidemic diseases are caused by transfers in tiny particles of spores that could transmit infection by direct or indirect contact or even without contact over long distances. He basically proposed the contagion theory for epidemics. And all he had at his disposal was the observation that there is something called an atom, something which you cannot be heard, and there's so small you cannot see them. And he, he just proposed this theory. Now, he was not the first. The first to propose the field of contagion was the Arab physician, Avicenna. In 1005, he actually proposed that there is contagion that these the tiny infectious particles traveling into the air can infect other people. Now, he also wrote a very long poem called Syphilis C. Morbus Gallicus, which means syphilis, the French disease, because he treated the shepherd boy, the shepherd boy's name was Syphilis, who had insulted Apollo and was punished with a horrible disease called Syphilis, he gave him mercury and helped him and wrote the star's poem. From him, we get the word Syphilis. So it's Fracastoro in 1476 who gave us the name Syphilis. He also described typhus and treated with mercury and was painted by Titan, the great painter, in exchange for treatment for syphilis. So he treated Titan with mercury. Titan actually drew his painting. And it's a great painting. Look at that. That's Fracastoro. So now remember, Fracastoro is immersed in the Middle Ages. Middle, Middle Ages lasted until the 1600. Descartes was born in 1596, and Descartes mm -hmm. matured, launched the Renaissance. So basically, this is Middle Ages, and the dogma was ruling, and he was saying things that don't belong to the human mind because they believed in spontaneous generation and miasma before humans, what have you, and they explained everything based on these things. <clears throat> okay. Now, this is Van Leeuwenhoek. Van Leeuwenhoek is probably the most important ancient man who taught us medicine. He was not a doctor. He was a haberdasher. He traded and sold with drapers and haberdashery. He just didn't like the magnifiers available at that time to study the quality of the fiber. He was a businessman in Senato. Unschooled, and uh, he was finally, after his observation, elected to the Royal Society in England in 1680, unheard of to elect an unphysician ever that to the Royal Society. As a draper, unsatisfied with the magnification of the he decided to create his own lenses, and he mastered lens making from a glass rod. He take a glass rod. Put it over a Bunsen burner until he separated, and you end up with a long, tiny tail. You would put the tail over the Bunsen burner until the drop form, and you drop the drop of water because you knew the smaller the lens and the more convex it is, the higher the magnification. And what he would do, he'd put that lens on an eyepiece, put the thing he would want to look at in the tip of the pin, adjust the distance, and study it. He developed photon microscopes up to 500 magnification. And what he did, not because he was a haberdasher, he was curious. He studied pond water, the great place. 
He was first to describe unicellular organisms. He didn't know to call them protozoa, but they were unicellular organisms. And multicellular microorganisms, he called them microbes, unicellular, and animalcules, or little animals, multicellular organisms. He not only did that, he studied muscle fiber, bacteria, spermatozoa, red cell, crystals in gunky tophi, and blood flow and capillary. He wasn't a physician, but he was curious. He developed his own tool, of microscopy, to see stuff. Microscopic life was first challenged by the church. Because he was saying there is a life that we cannot see, and the church said, no, 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 no. God did not do that. No, no, everything that you can see is life. So the church sent three highly ranked experts, and he took them on a pond tour. He would take water from the pond, put it on his microscope, and say, now, what do you call this? What do you call that? And he would show them the bacteria and the unicellular organism, the multicellular, until finally they said, okay, okay. And the church finally allowed him to publish his observation. Because dogma was that there is no such thing as a microscopic life. So this man broke the, broke the dogma of the Middle Ages. Okay, this is him looking at his microscope. Notice that. The, the, the specimen is at the tip of the microscope, the tip here, and this is the eyepiece, and he's magnifying things, and what he would do, he would draw them, because there were no way to photograph anything. So he would draw the specimens that he saw. Okay, thanks to uh, Stephen Hope, we have microscopy. He became the most well-known microscopist in Europe, he was visited by the Tsar Caesar, by very famous people, and he would show them the microscopy results, but he never told them the secret of making microscopes. So he was, he, he was the, the only one who did it. Then you all know about Edward Jenner, <laughs> Voltaire, who came before Jenner, said that at this time, 60% of the population caught smallpox and 20% of the population died. In 1721, lady, English lady, lady Portley, Montague, imported variolation to Britain from Constantinople. Small box was called variola. And what they would do, they would take someone who had small box, puncture one of these pustules, and inoculate other people with it. What happened was they got a big inflamed ulcer, and then it healed, and they became immune to small box. This had been known for a thousand years before by the Sharkassians who were on the steppes between uh, the, on the Balkan steppes beyond Turkey up to China. They knew they called it variolation and they did that. The Turks picked it up from them. And this English lady saw that. She said, that's wonderful because smallpox was terrifying to English people. So she came to England and told people about what the Sharkassians were doing. By 1768, the English physician, John Houston, had realized that prior infection with cowpox rendered the person immune to smallpox. That was a breakthrough. Because until then, they were variolizing. They were, they were actually inoculating people with three smallpox and one in a hundred died. They all got sick, but then they recovered and they couldn't get smallpox. When Houston realized that if you get infected with cowpox, the cowmates who have cowpox on the fingers did not get smallpox. Cowpox is a mild disease. Smallpox is a deadly disease. Well, when that became known, investigators who were non physicians, they were farmers, investigators in England and Germany, started to study the idea of cowpox preventing smallpox. One of them in 1774, Jesse Benjamin Jesse who had a dairy. So he took us from the pasture of a cowboy. He not played his own family because there was an epidemic of smallpox. And they survived. Soon the news spread and people would come to him and vaccinate. He collected the data and published it and, and sent it to the Royal Society in London because he had enough data to show cowpox actually prevents smallpox. 20 years after, in 1796, I remember, Jesse, Benjamin Jesse was 1774, 
1796, which is 20, 28 years after Fuster and uh, 22 years after Jesse, Jenner did something no one else had done. He scraped parts from cowpox, blisters, the milkmaid, and inoculated an eight year old boy. Then he waited a month and he injected the boy with, with smallpox material, variolous material, the standard method of immunization at the time. And no disease followed after a month of the challenge. He repeated the experiment with other people. None of them would succumb to smallpox. He published the result of what he had controls, saying, This really works. His unique contribution was that he proved by subsequent challenges that patient became immune to smallpox. The father of smallpox was not the first to vaccinate with cowpox. It was preceded by 20, 30 years of other people. He also demonstrated that protective cowpox pus could be effectively inoculated from person to person. The first in history to go with any viral culture. He gave you cowpox, and then when you had this disease, he take pus from you and give it to somebody else. You were basically a living viral culture. In 1840, 44 years later, the British government banned regulation. No more inoculation with smallpox it was all cowpox. Okay, the term vaccine, vaccination, were invented by Jennifer. They were derived from the Yolai, vaccinae, which is the smallpox of cow. Because in Latin, vaca is cow, that in French is vache. So he used that term to make, to make the term vaccine. And it now is universally used. Jenner is called the father of immunology, and his work is said to have saved more lives than the work of any other human being. The smallpox was so rapid. Napoleon, the old people, had all his French troops vaccinated, cowpox, awarded Jenner a medal. At the request of Jenner, released two English prisoners of war, remarking that he would not refuse anything to one of the greatest benefactors of France. This is Jenner. Now, what do you think happened when Jenner saved all these people, England, other countries, and vaccination became popular? The number of people who you know, seeing knowledge started to attack Jenner for vaccinating people. So it was an anti-vaccine movement. That sound familiar? <laughs> These are the people with bloody uh, swords wanting to attack gender and look at the number of people down here who have smallpox and have died or are dying. But on that, there was a rumor that if you take cowpox, you will grow cow appendages. So these poor people are growing cow heads and out of their mouth, and out of their eyes, because they just rest. That was a very powerful anti vaccine move that they had to overcome. <coughs> Nothing has changed. Dogma, dogma is our greatest enemy. Okay. Now we leave Jenner and we go to uh, Semmelweis. Semmelweis wanted to be an intern. He could not get in. So he went to Grand College of Center to get his MD. And, you know, he's in the Austro Hungarian Empire, he's Hungarian, not high class. But he's known as the savior of mothers from purple fever, the pioneer of antiseptic procedure. Now, when he was assigned to a Vienna maternity hospital, there were two wards. One ward was run by physicians, and one was run by midwives. He noticed that the ward run by physicians had three times the mortality from purple fever than the ward run by midwives. Total fever is streptococcus pyogeny through a infection causing septicemia to fail. Never wise was puzzled that total fever was there among women giving street births to avoid admission to deadly hospital wards. The women realized if you go to the hospital, you could die. So they were giving birth in the street because even if they gave birth in the street, you could walk into the hospital and say, I couldn't help it. The baby came out, and then the government would take care of their babies. 
So what protect the F himself, what protected those who delivered outside the clinic from these destructive, unknown, endemic corporate leaders? Now remember that, that microscopy had been invented. And that, you know, even her could see bacteria, could see fungi, and could see protozoa, could see cellular organisms and fungi. All of that knowledge did not come to anybody's mind as this is possible explanation for the junk fields. He's just asking why. So what do you do? There was a breakthrough. He sees the, the coincidence. Um, Try hand, hand disinfection. Oh, sorry, I'm missing a slide here. Yeah. So, you know, one of his friends was doing an autopsy and he was struck by a knife from the autopsy and he died. And uh, Kolechka's, Kolechka's own autopsy showed pathology similar to that of the women who were dying of liver fever. Cellulite proposed the connection between the very contamination and liver fever. First time you could say, okay, these people have the same pathology. He concluded that. And, and the medical students carried cadavers, particles on their hands from the autopsy room to the patients in the first protective clinic. This explained why students, midwives, in the second clinic, who were not engaged in autopsy, so a much trouble on that. So there was an idea that sparked in his mind. Okay, here it is. Okay, what do you do? He tried hand disinfection with hydrated bleaching powder. Why? Why hydrated bleaching powder, which was being used to remove the putrid smell of infected autopsy tissue, theorizing that perhaps it destroyed the causal cadaveric agent being transmitted by hands. So just bleach powder, calcium hypochlorite. The result was the mortality rate dropped 90%. Mortality rate in April 47 or 18 after hand disinfection dropped to 2.2 in July. 1.2 in August, 1.9, and then to zero in the year after. He eliminated purple sepsis with, with hand washing with each part. Several wise hypotheses that all that matter was cleanliness, hands and instruments, was extreme at the time, and some doctors were offended, offended at the suggestion that they should wash their hands and mocked him. That we are gentlemen, we don't wash our hands. Patients are beneath us, so they're in indigent patients. And they thought that corporal fever was due to uncleanliness of the bowel. Therefore, extensive purging was the preferred treatment. That was the time done. Now, there was this man saying, look, if you wash hands, mortality drops down to zero. And what does dogma do to the mind of the physician then say, no, 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 no. You're wrong. It's, it's not that. It's, it's this. No amount of evidence will sway the mind. So what happened to the poor guy? He was dismissed from the hospital. Five, harassed by the medical community in Vienna and forced to remove to Budapest. Outraged at the indifference of the medical profession, he began writing angry letters to European obstetricians, calling them irresponsible murderers. His contemporaries and his wife believed he was losing his mind. 1865, 20 years after his breakthrough, he suffered a nervous breakdown, was committed to an asylum, and died at 47, septicemia after he was beaten to death by the guards. Samuel Weiss's practice earned widespread acceptance only years after his death, test the resistance of dogma. When Louis Pasteur confirmed the germ theory, Joseph Lister, acting on the French microbiologist's research, practiced and operated using antiseptic methods with great success. So this poor man died for it, and he, in his lifetime, could never recover. Now, this is really shocking. He, he was a scientist. He kept, he kept numbers. This is the second clinic with the midwives. Practice. We didn't do autopsies. This is where the doctors were. These are the years, and this is the percent of patients who died. Purple fever, yearly mortality rates. Okay? Until 47. Then look at that. High mortality, high mortality, 47, and washing is introduced. Now, this is evidence 
was shown to finish. Another graph, this is a control hospital that didn't have the uh, dynamics of the strength of the corporate field. And this is the, the, the other hospital that slowly started to have higher, higher mortality until hand washing was started. This is showing what happened if you wash your hands with soap and then put it on the other, wash your hands with uh, alcohol, mm -hmm. and yeah, and wash them disinfectant. So he, he showed that washing hands is not enough and that you really need to disinfect. This was a great moment for for, for physicians, but they didn't really want to believe it. They wanted to believe their dogma. Doctors were gentlemen, their hands were clean, they didn't need to wash their hands, and if the patient died, it's their problem in love with them. It's, it's amazing what and we can discover we can do. Finally, he's rewarded on a gold coin uh, for his work in the uh, epidemiology of the disease. Now we go to the next Pasteur was the one who proved the germ theory. After Pasteur, people were not talking about miasma and about spontaneous regeneration. There were germs, they could see them in the microscope, they could stain them, they could culture them. The, the idea was obsolete. Now, he proved the germ theory and this proved spontaneous regeneration that believed living organisms could arise from dust in dead man. The also beverage contamination led tested to the idea that microorganisms infected animals cause disease. It was new. In the experiment, he got some sterilized seed flasks. He covered the top and no microorganism grew, but when he opened the top, the microorganisms grew. So he could tell if there are microorganisms floating in the air, they can go down and grow. Then he makes this pronouncement, never would the doctrine of spontaneous generation recover from the mortal blow of the simple experiment. There is no known circumstance in which it can be confirmed that microscopic beings came into the world without germs, without parents, similar to themselves. Well, this was a big statement, like saying, okay, guys, it, it, they just can't, can't form themselves just like that and all be alike in all countries. <coughs> parents living birth to the child, which looks like. Okay, because of his study in germs, Pasteur encouraged doctors to sanitize their hands and equipment before surgery. Prior to this, few doctors for their assistance practiced this procedure. He proposed preventing the entry of microorganisms into the human body, leading Joseph Liston, famous Scottish surgeon, to develop antiseptic methods in surgery, develop the principles of vaccination, fermentation, Past sterilization, you will come from Pasteur, by the way, and all the germs that are known as Pasteurella, the Ramses and Pestis, all come from Pasteur. Treating milk and beer and wine stops bacterial contamination. So he treated these things so that he would not give the bacteria to treat the population. Demonstrated that skin of grapes was the natural source of yeasts, that sterilized grapes and grape juice never fermented, did not make wine and produced the first vaccine for rabies by growing the virus in rabbits, and then weakening it by drying the affected rabbits. Now, this seems like a simple thing to us, but remember, Pasteur knew that rabies does not affect rodents. Rodents are immune to rabies. They can get the disease, but they don't die from it, they don't transmit it. So what did he choose? He inoculated it from the dogs of rabid dogs. He had an assistant to hold the dog. He put his hand in the mouth and sucked from the salivary gland and inoculated it. And inoculated from one rabbit to another, to another, to another. Thinking that if you inoculate it often, the virus will become weakened. Got the idea from Jenner, because Jenner used smallpox, which is a weak form of, uh, used the cowpox, which is a weak form of smallpox, to create immunity. So he thought he'd do the same thing. And after that, he took the nerves, he dried them, he grinded them, and then used them as vaccines. And his first patient, Joseph Meister, was 10 years old, and a brainy dog chewed him up. He came, they brought him to the hospital, he was just bitten so many places, and was then at that center. 
very dark mountain bikes, and so on. And through the complicated issue, it was Pasteur was not a physician, he should not be giving injections. He collaborated with another person, they gave this person 12 series of vaccines, and he survived against all odds. And he became the guard on the Pasteur Institute, which stayed there until the day he died. Because Pasteur was the one who saved his life. His name is Joseph Meister. Okay. Now, Pasteur, he cultivated bacteria from the blood of animals, infected with anthrax. When he inoculated animals with the bacteria, anthrax occurred, proving that the bacteria was the source of the disease. This was undone, never done before. He actually cultivated an organism, gave it to another animal, and produced the same disease. Cattle in France were dying of anthrax, and they called them the cursed feeds. And he went to investigate. He found that they were burying the anthrax dead animals in the fields. And he realized that cutworms were, were getting infected, and when they come up to the surface, the feces would contain anthrax. He found anthrax in the earthworm excrement. So the farmers stopped burying dead animals in the fields. That's how he cured the anthrax anthrax epidemic. He discovered that growing anthrax in still at about 42 degrees made them sporeless. And eating anthrax and potassium dichromate weakened the bacteria and allowed them to use an anthrax. So not only he made rabies vaccines, he made anthrax vaccines. He found solutions for epidemics that nobody else knew what to do. This is Louis Pasteur himself. Now we go to Lister. Everybody has heard of uh, Joseph Lister. He's a British surgeon, pioneer of antiseptic surgery. He worked at the last glory infirmary to use carbonic acid, which is phenol, to sterilize surgical instruments and phenols. He suspected he, sus he suspected phenol is a disinfectant, just like a cell line suspected that. Uh, Bleach powder for the disinfectant because it killed the putrid odor of cadavers. You know, Lister said, well, you know, phenol is a disinfectant because it was used to ease the stench from trees irrigated with sewage waste. And he presumed it was safe because the fields treated with carbonic acid produced more apparent illness in the livestock than later grazing on. Very simple reasoning, but he thought it was good. And he tried it. Lister's work led to a reduction in post operative infection and made several favorable patients, distinguishing him as the father of modern research. He had very high results, very low patients. This is Lister when he was young and handsome. Uh, <laughs> before him, most people believed that chemical damage from exposure to bad air was responsible for infection. So it was not the doctor's responsibility. I hope, you know, it's bad air. What can I do? You know, it doesn't matter if I don't wash my hand. Now, this is a, a picture of Lister, actual photograph of Lister operating on the patient. Now, notice there are no gloves. They're not wearing gloves. Also, notice they're wearing their suits. The idea of a white gown and washing hands was not there. This is Lister when he was very phenol on the patient, trying to reduce the infection from the skin. Before this, hospital wards were aired at midday as a precaution against the spread of infection via miasma, which is the bad stuff at the end. Facilities for washing hands or a patient's wound were not available. You could not wash your hands even if you wanted to. The surgeon was not required to wash his hands before seeing the patient because such practices were not considered necessary. Despite the work of Oliver, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Oliver Wendell Holmes preceded several lines by six years. He was, he didn't improve the same thing that several lines proved that corporate fever can be prevented if people wash their hands with their hands. Surgeons of the time referred to the good old surgical stink and took pride in the, in, in the stains on their under, unwashed operating ground as a display of their experience. So the stink was something to brag about means your experience on the surface. You've seen a lot. 
Now, while the professor of surgery at the University of Glasgow, Mister became aware of a paper published by the French chemist Louis Pasteur, showing that food spoilage would occur under anaerobic conditions by organisms were present. Pasteur suggested three methods to eliminate the microorganisms filtration, exposure to heat, or exposure to chemical solution. Mister confirmed Pasteur's conclusions with his own experiments. Using phenolic acid, he decided to use his findings to develop antiseptic techniques for wounds. Mr. applied a piece of lint dipped in carbonic acid on the wound of a 70 year old boy at Glasgow Infirmary who had sustained a compound fracture after a cartwheel and passed over the back of the left side. These are all discoveries. Now, seven whites with text. Remember what happened to several whites? He kept showing them data. Look, guys, if you just if you just wash with bleach powder, you eliminate mortality. And they kept they fired him and they went back to their old practices because dogma was more important than evidence, which is part of how we are constituted as human beings. The Lister instructed surgeons under the responsibility to wear clean gowns and wash their hands before and after operation with five percent carbonic acid. Instruments were also washed in the same solution, and assistants sprayed the solution in the operating field. In 1869, at the meetings of the British Association at Leeds, Pister's ideas were mocked. And again, in 1873, the medical journal, The Lancet, The Lancet, warned the entire medical profession against his progressive ideas. Believe that, Dr. Jerry? As the germ theory of disease became more understood, it was realized that infection could be better avoided by preventing bacteria from getting into wounds. On the 100th anniversary of his death, 2012, this was considered by most in the medical field the father of modern research. So these people had to die before somebody believed their evidence because dogma in our minds prevents us, keeps us alive. Koch, he was her, we Koch. Postulates. Koch was a brilliant man, German physician, microbiologist, founder of modern bacteriology. He identified specific positive agents of tuberculosis, cholera, and anthrax. He won the Nobel Prize in 1905 for his research and TB. He developed techniques of growing bacteria, isolated and grew, selected pathogens in pure culture, first time in pure culture. He used agar in place of potato and gelatin. To grow bacteria, they would take a thin slice of potato and grow bacteria. He actually used agar. And agar is a polysaccharide. It remains solid at 37, which is the incubator temperature. It's not degraded by most bacteria and forms a transparent medium, so you can actually see through it. In dry fixed bacterial cultures on glass slides, you use dyes to stain the culture to observe them through a microscope. Kind of the forerunner of cancer. stain. Because he could grow bacteria in pure culture and inoculate animals, he created these postulates. Cox's four postulates. The organism must always be present in every case of the disease. So if you're animal at anthrax, then it should be there. The organism must be isolated from a host containing the disease and grown in pure culture, which he did. Samples of the organism taken from pure culture must cause the same disease and inoculated with the healthy, susceptible animal in the breath. Which he did. The organism must be isolated from the inoculated animal. It must be identified as the same original organism first isolated from the original disease. These are the whole postures. They prove beyond doubt that this bug causes that disease. He also discovered that anthrax bacteria have dormant spores. He was the first to link a specific microorganism with a specific disease, rejecting spontaneous generation, supporting germ theory. Experiments on guinea pigs with tuberculosis satisfied all four of his postulates. I believe one caused TB, I one caused TB. In 1882, he published his findings on tuberculosis and reported the causative agent as microbacterial tuberculosis, isolated culture, and new organism. Then he got in trouble. He produced tuberculin by some kind of eating of the bacteria. And he thought tuberculin was a vaccine because he was going to give it to people and prevent tuberculosis. And the government backed him up 
So we thought a very expensive project. And after a few years, people were getting tuberculosis and the government was spending it. But he also observed acquired immunity because the New Guinea natives who had malaria, if a foreigner came in, they got very sick from the malaria. The New Guinea native didn't get very sick, so they knew there was a natural acquired immunity. Okay, this is a distinguished gentleman who is now honored for being the first really true microbiologist who linked bacteria with the disease. Remember what I said that nobody was using gloves? You operated with your hands. You were lucky if you washed them with antiseptic. Otherwise, the gentleman doctor, you just wore your suit and operated with your hands. William. Posted. He is now known as the father of modern surgery because he emphasized strict aseptic technique during surgical procedure, along with also in Atwood, in Kelly, in Welsh, they founded the Johns Hopkins Hospital. During his internship, Halstead was introduced to antiseptic surgery to physicians using Joseph Lister's technique created in 1867. Hospitals were unsanitary, surgical tools weren't cared for, and interns ran around hospitals with buckets full of pus. That was the state of the art. Now, at Bellevue Hospital, that he erected a tent for his surgical area where he could practice antiseptic surgery, he didn't want any fall out. His project cost the hospital $10,000, but they paid it. In 82, he performed probably the first cholecystostomy, which is in the United States on his mother in the kitchen table at two in the morning, in which he removed seven goats. He used either to put her to sleep, put the stone down and said, performed the first emergency blood transfusion in the US, withdrew his own blood, transfused his sister who was hemorrhaging after perturbation, then operated and saved her life. Unthinkable. But whether it's rash or courage, you know what if his blood didn't match, these were ideas that didn't come to him. We just had to say the sister. Now, he, he practiced, he, he knew that cooking is a very good local anesthetic, and he experimented with himself. He became addicted to cooking, to cooking. and the addictions resulted in experiments of cooking as a local anesthetic that he performed himself and the students and others. In the process, Halstead and some of his colleagues became addicted to cooking. And what did they do? They used morphine to control their addiction for the rest of their lives. Because it's, it's, it's a new concept. Because if you're addicted, they will take you away, stop your addiction, withdraw. He actually used morphine and function as a surgeon for the rest of his life. Another new idea, which now we do, we, we maintain people on opioids to prevent addiction. Okay. Started the first foreign <laughs> surgical residency training program in the US at John Falcon which began in 1889, first to introduce rubber gloves into the operating room for surgery in 1889, drastically increasing sanitation operation. The main reason for introducing rubber gloves was to protect hands of his current nurse, Carolyn Hampton, who later became, he had his eye on Carolyn Hampton. Then she delivered a dermatitis from the phenol carbonic acid. She was allergic to the antiseptic, so Hulk said engaged in a good year rubber company to start making rubber gloves soon after he introduced and implemented data So Hulk said, is why we are wearing gloves in the operating room. Before then, everybody used his bare hands. Now, to bring Hulk close to home, Hulk said, train Rainey Williams. Rainey Williams was the chief of surgery and the VA here for years and years and years, and his grandson is one of your classmates. This is Holstead, when he was an old man. These are incredibly brave people who can do these things. Okay, now Erlich. Erlich was the founder of genes. He invented the precursor technique of gram stain. He was kind of got things started along the staining bacteria. He was interested in stains. He developed methods for staining tissue. So the pathology, making it possible to distinguish between different types of blood cells. 
He formed an idea that it could be possible to create specific microbes which cause disease in the body without harming the body itself. Unknown. Unknown before. That he could actually kill the organism and not kill the body. He named the hypothetical agent the magic bullet. That's what the name of it. He developed the magic bullet for syphilis in 1909, arsenamine, which proved amazingly effective versus mercury salts, which were used before. In Hirsch, the center stand, that was the name of the arsenamine, became the most widely prescribed drug in the world. First, first antibiotic prescribed in the world is the anti syphilis medicine, center stand. He won the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine. And Robert Koch presented the lecture on how to identify the tuberculosis pathogens, called it the greatest experience in science. After tuberculin failed to cure tuberculosis as a to treat as a vaccine, early tried to support Koch by stressing the value of tuberculin for diagnostic purposes. So the TPD was born out of the idea of creating a vaccine when it failed, then we learned to use it as a diagnostic. Collaborating with Koch, we founded the Institute of Serum Research, we exchanged offspring and treated and untreated female mice, the mice which were nursed were protected, providing proof that antibodies can be conveyed. This is Koch. I mean, uh, we end with Alexander Fleming. We all know about Fleming, Penicillin, famous. You know, Scottish physician who during World War I witnessed the death of many soldiers from sepsis. Antisepsis, which were used to treat infected wounds, often worsened the injury because they killed the viral tissue, which defends you against infection. In an article submitted to the Lancet, Fleming explained why antiseptics were killing more soldiers than infections. One sometimes finds what one is not looking for itself. When I woke up just after dawn on September 28, 1928, I certainly didn't plan to revolutionize all medicine by discovering the world's first, but really second, antibiotic or bacteria killer. But I suppose that was exactly what happened. On September 3, 1928, Fleming noticed that one of his culture plates was contaminated with a fungus that the colonists studied the toxin immediately surrounding the fungus had been destroyed. Fleming grew them all because his eyes knew this was a serious coincidence. He grew them all in a pure culture and found that it produced a substance that killed a number of disease causing bacteria. He identified the most genus as penicillium, named the substance produced penicillin. Penicillin destroyed staphylococci and other gram positive pathogens that cause scarlet fever, point in angiotis, bacteria. It also destroyed gram negative and serum on reading. One of Fleming's friends was a marksman. There was a very important marksmanship contest. And he was one of the marksmen destined to win, but he developed acute conjunctivitis. And uh, Fleming, cultural staff from the side. And he goes to his other plate, which was growing in his name and puts a few drops of saline, shakes it around the fungus, puts it in his friend's eye, and cures it. He wins the contest. Talk about balls. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Fleming, with the help of chemists, worked with chemical mold for 20 years. 20 years. As before, he asked Glory and the uh, chain at the Radcliffe Infirmary Council to mass produce They started mass production after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, December 7, 41. By D Day, June 6, 44, enough medicine had been produced to treat all the wounded in the Allies. Sir Henry Harris, in 1928, said, Without Fleming, no chain, without chain, no glory, without glory, no Italy, without Italy, no medicine. Before Fleming, several scientists had published or pointed out that mold or penicillium species were able to inhibit bacteria growth, and even to cure bacterial infections in animals. What did they do with that discovery? Nothing. They just shifted. They did not realize or recognize that this chance discovery is very valuable. Fleming was the first to push these studies further by isolating the penicillin 
a fungus and seeking help to promote the large scale production. This is a quote from Albert von Zen Yogi. Discovery consists of seeing what everybody has seen and thinking what nobody has thought. We all saw it, but nobody thought to use it. Fleming also discovered very early that bacteria develop antibiotic resistance. Now, not only he discovers penicillin, he talks about antibiotic resistance, which was unheard of because there were no antibiotics. <laughs> he cautioned not to use penicillin unless there was a properly diagnosed reason that if it were used, never to use too little or for too short a period, since these are the circumstances under which bacteria resistance to antibiotics develops. He also cautioned the microbes are educated to resist penicillin and a host of penicillin fast organisms and bred out. The thoughtless person playing with penicillin is morally responsible for the death of the man who finally succumbs to infection with the penicillin resistant organism. Look how far ahead of the time it is. You could repeat the same words today about antibiotic stewage. This is a picture of them expecting. And the last quote I put here reiterates everything you, you see. It says, the Richon, the observation, and the field of observation, the hasard, coincidence, the favorism has not failed to les esprit except the airlines. In the fields of observation, coincidence does not fail except the prepared minds. Many minds met with the coincidence, they were not prepared. The past, nothing was done. Thank you. Bye. Any question? <laughs> It's very humbling when you look at what your colleagues have done. It's very humbling. 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 It's Thank you, all of you, and uh, thank you, Dr. Sala, and that concludes our case conference for this month. Thank you. Wait, can you put that up there? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you.